Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides on the lecture on blood vessels. On this title page, what you can see is you can uh, see a diagram depicting the cardiovascular system, which comprises of the heart, which is the pump, and the blood vessels around the body. And the picture on the right, what you can see is you can see the forearm, forearm of a person with their fist clenched, and that then brings the superficial veins um, into a uh, stark um, contrast. When we look at what we're going to cover today, what we're going to do is we're going to cover the basics of cardiovascular circulation, followed by the structure of blood vessels. So when we talk about the structure of blood vessels, we're going to go through the basic layers and components of blood vessels, and then we're going to explore the differences between arteries and veins and capillaries. And then we're going to finish off by a, with a short discussion on the distribution of blood flow, which includes what happens with systemic blood pressure and then which blood vessels carry oxygenated versus those that carry deoxygenated blood. So firstly is the cardiovascular circulation. You may be surprised to know that the formation of blood vessels, angiogenesis, starts in utero and continues throughout life. The human, the average adult human body has about 60,000 miles of a or 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels. And I'll put that in perspective in the next slide. In terms of the circulation pathway, there are two different types of circulation pathway. The first one is what is found um, in most of the body, and so we'll call it the normal circulation pathway. And the second one is the portal system. So in the normal circulation pathway, what happens is blood leaves the heart, goes into the arteries, through one capillary bed, and then it returns to the heart, right? Goes, as I said, leaves the heart, goes through one capillary bed, and returns to the heart. Leaves the heart, goes through one capillary bed, and then returns to the heart, right? And um, in terms of the normal circulation pathway, this is what's called parallel circuits. And what this does is it means that if you've got, um, oxygenated blood leaving the left ventricle over here, and you've got um, nutrient-rich blood leaving um, the uh, uh, blood vessels over here, what happens is all these different circulation um, capillary bits have access to highly oxygenated um, blood. So this is what's called parallel circuits because you've got this running parallel to each other. The other type of circuit is called a series circuit. So in the series circuit, what happens is you would have the heart, and what happens is the blood leaves the heart, goes into one capillary bed, and then from there it goes to a second, and then a third, and then a fourth, right? And what you can see is if uh, um, the, circuit, the circuit is in series, what happens is the amount of oxygen that this capillary bed here gets is higher than the one in the second one, is higher than the one in the third one, is higher than the one in the fourth one. So you don't want it to be in series, you want it to be in parallel, similar to what's in the, uh, in the top diagram there, in order for all the um, blood vessels and all the capillary beds to have access to the same highly oxygenated blood. So the um, there are two types of um, normal circulation pathway. One of them is called the systemic circulation and it leaves the left ventricle, goes out into the aorta, and then into um, smaller and smaller um, arteries and arterioles until it reaches the systemic capillary beds. And then after that, it's the, the um, blood is then collected into small venules and then into increasingly larger veins, and then it goes back into the heart through the right atrium, right? So that's the systemic circulation. The second type of circulation is called the pulmonary circulation. So in this, what happens is blood leaves the right ventricle, goes into the pulmonary trunk, where it um, enters into the pulmonary artery, and then into the capillary bed that's found in the lungs, so that oxygen can actually enter into the blood and carbon dioxide 
actually leaves, right? So in this way, this is the pulmonary circulation um, um, transports blood to the lungs and back so that the lungs can, um, so that oxygen can enter into the uh, pulmonary capillaries at, in the lungs and carbon dioxide can leave. And then what happens is then you can see that it's collected by pulmonary venules, veins, and then it goes back into the heart through the left atrium, right? And then you've got that cycle again. So those are the systemic and pulmonary circulation. The other type of circulation that's not normal is called the portal circulation. And the portal circulation is the one that's in series. So what you have is you have the heart, and blood goes from the heart into one capillary bed and from that first capillary bed into the second one before actually returning back to the heart. And the reason is that each of these different portal systems have specific um, reasons for its presence. The first one is found in the brain and what happens is that the uh, hypophysial portal system basically um, um, transports blood directly from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. And what happens is that um, when blood goes to the hypothalamus, it releases hormones in very small amounts, and these hormones go directly to the anterior pituitary where there are receptors for those specific hormones in the anterior pituitary. Right? So it doesn't have to go into the systemic circulation. It goes directly from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. The second type of uh, portal system is found in between the, um, I'm just erasing all this, um, between the digestive organs and the liver. And so in this case, what happens is most of the nutrients that's absorbed by the digestive system, 90% um, of the absorption happens in the small intestine. And so the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, goes into the blood vessels, into the capillary bed in the small intestines, and those nutrients then are transported directly to the liver. And the reason why it's transported directly to the liver is that the liver is a processing as well as a storage area for those nutrients. So when we absorb amino acids from the small intestine, what happens is that amino acid is then goes directly to the liver. The liver then produces or uh, synthesizes proteins, right? Same with, car uh, same with carbs. So carbohydrates are absorbed in the small intestine as either mono or disaccharides goes into um, from the small intestine uh, circulation directly to the liver where it can either be made into different things or it can be stored as glycogen, right? So again, this um, hepatic portal system actually makes sense because the liver is a factory for a lot of nutrient processing and storage. In terms of resistance and flow, anytime you have a liquid flowing through a tube, you have some resistance as the fluid um, hits the wall of that tube, right? So the resistance of um, in the blood vessel is directly proportional to its length. So if you have more blood vessels, then resistance will be higher. And when resistance is higher, it's harder for the heart to actually pump the blood. So as I said, um, an average person weighing 150 pounds has 60,000 miles or 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels in the body. And when we actually compare it to the diameter of the earth, the diameter, the di diameter of the earth is 12, thousand or just under 13,000 kilometers. And so we have five times the uh, distance around the earth in blood vessels in our body. When we look at the um, amount of um, the length of blood vessels that is found in one pound of adipose tissue compared to one pound of skeletal muscle, what we find out here 
is that one pan of adipose tissue typically contains about 200 miles of blood vessels and one pound of skeletal muscle typically contains about 400 miles of, bl of blood vessels. And just to put it on co in context, the distance between Toronto and Montreal is 336 miles. Now, I'm not asking you to memorize these numbers. I'm just asking you to be in awe about the amount of hard work that our heart does every single um, waking and sleeping moment that um, of our lives, right? So what happens is when we gain weight, so when we gain, say, 10 pounds, it can add anywhere between 2,000 or to 4,000 miles of vessels, depending on whether we're adding uh, fat or uh, muscle. Um, and so, again, um, it, it um, puts stress on the heart to actually pump that extra distance um, of blood through those extra blood vessels. What we also find out is when the diameter of the blood vessel changes, it can really affect how much blood can actually go through that blood vessel. So if you look at the diagrams down below, what you can see here is you've got this normal diameter blood vessel. So you can see here the inside of the blood vessel, which is um, where the hollow opening is, that's called the lumen. So the lumen is this size in a normal diameter blood vessel. And when the blood vessel is enlarged, it undergoes vasodilation. What happens is that lumen increases. And when that lumen increases, what happens is the resistance goes down and the amount of blood that can flow through that blood vessel increases, right? Increases by 16 times. This is very important in a few different ways. One is that when we exercise, what happens is the blood vessels that supply our skeletal muscle go from normal diameter to this vasodilated state. And you can imagine if you have vasodilation, then more blood can actually go to the um, to the skeletal muscle, and it gives us energy and oxygen and nutrients um, for us to actually exercise. The other thing is that in some pathophysiological conditions, such as arthrosclerosis, what happens is the blood vessel um, lumen gets decreased because of the presence of arthrosclerotic plaque. And so if you have these plaques on the inside of the blood vessel wall, it actually narrows the diameter of the blood vessel wall. And that means that if you have vasoconstriction, or as I said, if the blood vessel is, is blocked by arthrosclerotic plaque, then what happens is the amount of blood that flows through the blood vessel goes down. And so the amount of oxygen and nutrients that can actually go to the, um, the uh, um, capillary beds also goes down, right? And so um, it, it then makes it very hard for the person to actually get enough um, oxygen, get enough nutrients um, to actually do their normal um, daily activities of living. In terms of the relationships between the vessels of the systemic circuit, what we can see here is this. So I know that there are four different graphs over here. Let me go through graphs A to D um, very briefly. So the first one talks about the vessel diameter. So that is how big, right, or how small it is. So what we can see here is as blood leaves the heart, the diameter of the aorta is large, right? Compared to the diameter of the capillaries, right? And we can see this because um, the aorta is relatively large and then what happens is it branches into smaller um, arteries and each of these smaller arteries then branch into smaller artery and then into from there into arterioles and then finally into capillaries. And so every time it branches, what happens is the successive blood vessels get smaller in diameter. 
Now, as it gets smaller in diameter, the total cross-sectional area of the vessel, so if we look at this, at each level, it increases because we only have one aorta, but it splits into um, many elastic arteries, which then split into many more muscular arteries and then into a huge amount of arterioles and a huge a bigger amount of capillaries. And so as the number of blood vessels at each of these levels increase, then the total cross-sectional areas also increase. So you can see over here, it stays fairly stable. It increases just a little bit from when it leaves the uh, left ventricle to when it gets into, say, the arterial level. So the arterial is just before it hits the capillary beds, and then you can see the cross-sectional area of the capillaries is huge. And then as blood is collected to go back to the heart, you can see the cross-sectional area then goes down, right? In terms of the average blood pressure, blood leaves the heart right here from the blood uh, from the left ventricle into the aorta, so the pressure is highest there. And then as it makes its way through the arterial system, into the capillary bed, and then down into the venules, it goes down and down and down until as it actually is about to return into the right um, atrium, it almost hits zero. And then this last table, uh, this last diagram over here talks about the speed of blood flow. So as blood leaves the aorta, it leaves it in a hurry, right? It gushes out of the aorta because what happens is the left ventricle contracts, pushes blood right out. And then as it goes down um, into, from the aorta to the elastic artery, muscular arteries, arterioles, it slows down. And the reason for it slowing down and you can see here that it's slowest at the level of the capillaries, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the capillaries. And then as blood is collected from the capillary bed, you can see that it starts to speed up again, although it never speeds up to the same extent as it's returning back to the right atrium as it does when it leaves the left ventricle. All right, so you'll see these... Um, these three out of these four diagrams throughout um, this lecture, and I'm going to put that in perspective. So when we look at the structure of the blood vessels, we've got two slides over here, right? This one and then the next one. So this slide basically shows you, um, highlights the different components of the blood vessel walls. And um, all blood vessels, as it says here, are tubes with a hollow passageway called a lumen and what you can see is the lumen in the artery is smaller and rounder than the lumen in the vein that's at the same level right so the veins are floppier they're bigger um, at the same level as their corresponding artery and we'll talk more about that as we go on in terms of what is found within the blood vessel walls, we've got elastic fibers. So if you look at the elastic fibers, you can see that in the artery, there are external elastic membrane, internal elastic membrane, and elastic fibers. And that's because the role of the arteries is to actually receive blood from the heart and then push it through. And the elastic uh, fibers in the arteries actually help to accommodate that push of blood as the ventricles contract and push blood out of the heart and help to accommodate the, 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 the blood in order to actually push it along towards the capillary bed. In the blood vessel walls, we also have the endothelium and the endothelium is the inner lining of the blood vessel wall. It's the only one that is in contact with blood normally, and it's a simple squamous epithelium in order for it to provide a smooth surface to protect against um, intravascular coagulation. If it's smooth, then the platelet plugs, uh, the platelets don't um, congregate to form a plug and then to form a clot. And it's simple squamous epithelium so that at the level of the capillaries, what happens is you have um, easy exchange 
of gases and other substances. We also have, so in terms of this uh, elastic fiber, you can see over here that veins don't have elastic fiber because the um, pressure of the blood as it goes through veins is very low. And so it doesn't need that elastic fiber in order to actually push um, the blood through. There's collagen fibers over here that's not shown in the diagrams to um, provide strength to keep the lumen open so that it doesn't collapse. There's also smooth muscles in the, um, in the blood vessel wall um, and the smooth muscle in both the artery and the vein, you can see that it's thicker in the artery compared to the vein um, and it, um, it exerts um, active tension in vessels um, when contracting. So it allows the blood vessels to contract and relax. And when it contracts and relax, it allows different volume of blood to actually flow through it. We've also got two other things. So the two other things that are found over here are the vasa vasorum and the nervi vasorum. So vasorum refers to blood vessels. So what happens is the blood vessel walls actually have their own blood vessel supply. The blood vessel wall have their own blood vessel supply because the blood vessels do work. And in order for the blood vessels to do work, contracting, relaxing, um, it needs a supply of blood to that tissue. And so the vasa vasorum supplies um, nutrient, promotes nutrient waste exchange, promotes gas, gas exchange within the thicker blood vessel walls. And the nervi, nervi refers to nerve, are small nerves within the blood vessel wall to actually control the contraction and dilation of the smooth muscle of the blood vessels. When we look at the layers, again, these are the same diagrams. I'm just highlighting different areas. Um, if we look at the layers of the blood vessels, we can see that it can be divided into three different layers, the outer, middle, and inner, right? The outer layer is called the tunica externa or the tunica adventitia. And so it is um, a fibrous connective tissue layer on the outside over here. And over here, and you can see you've got the, the vasovasorum over here as well. Um, and it's uh, thicker in uh, arteries um, compared to veins. The middle layer, as you can see over here, is the tunica media. It's made out of smooth muscle. And the smooth muscle contains connective tissue, um, elastic collagen fibers. And that's the one that can contract and relax in order to actually propel blood um, away from the heart, um, from the heart to the capillary bits and then back to the heart, as well as to regulate how big or small the blood vessel um, diameter is. And then the third layer is the tunica interna or the tunica intima. And that's the innermost layer. That's the one that's, that's the one that's um, usually the only one that's in contact with, uh, with uh, blood. And it's um, continuous with, um, uh, it's a continuous layer um, that's also called the endothelium um, in blood vessels or the endocardium in the heart, right? So it's a continuous layer, simple squamous epithelium um, in the cardiovascular system. When we look at blood vessels, they're categorized by size as well as direction of flow. So when we um, categorize blood vessels in terms of direction of flow, the blood vessels that receive blood from the heart whether it be the left ventricle or the right ventricle, are called arteries. And as they get smaller, they're called uh, arterioles, right? So what happens over here is the left ventricle pumps blood into the systemic arteries and the right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary arteries. 
from the arteries, it goes, blood goes into the capillary beds, and the capillary beds are the smallest, smallest uh, um, blood vessels, and that's when the exchange of gas and other substances occur. And then what happens is then blood is then collected from the capillary beds into the veins. So um, in the pulmonary circuit, blood leaves the right ventricle to enter into the pulmonary arteries, goes into the pulmonary uh, capillaries, and then back to the heart through the pulmonary veins. Whereas in the systemic circulation, what happens is blood leaves the left ventricle, enters into the systemic arteries, systemic um, capillaries, and then back into the right atrium through the systemic um, veins, right? So veins and arteries and capillaries um, are categorized according to direction of flow. In terms of the types of arteries and arterioles, what you can see over here is that in general, as I said, arterioles are blood vessels that conduct blood away from the heart towards a capillary bed. Um, relatively speaking, the walls of arteries are thicker than the walls of their corresponding um, um, veins because they have to withstand a higher pressure of blood um, as it leaves the heart. So again, this is the pressure of our arteries and you can see as it goes away from the heart, the pressure drops, whereas the um, pressure in the venous system is much lower, okay? When we go on to the different types of arteries, what we have is elastic conducting arteries, muscular distributing artery, ar arteries, and, and arterioles. So um, the elastic or conducting arteries are the largest. They're found closest to the heart. They're, they have the thickest wall with the most elastic fibers in order to actually receive blood from the ventricles to actually push it through to the muscular or distributing arteries, right? If you look over here, the um, elastic arteries are larger in diameter, muscular arteries are smaller, arterioles even smaller, and then capillaries are the smallest. Um, the art, the, um, so we've got more muscular or distributing arteries compared to elastic or conducting arteries. And that's because the muscular arteries are the ones that direct flow between the elastic arteries towards the arterioles. And so there's more of them, it goes, um, it gets dispersed throughout the body. And then the arterioles are the smallest type of artery and it leads to the capillary bed. In all three layers, what we can, uh, in all three different types of arteries, you can see that the three layers are present. What you, what you can also see is that the, the layer of um, smooth muscle is largest proportionally in the elastic artery compared to the arterial, right? As I said, arterioles then lead to capillaries. Capillaries are very, very small microscopic v uh, vessels which carry blood from the arterioles to the venules. If you look at the diagram, at the picture down below over here, you can see um, a picture of a capillary and the red blood cells um, within it. And what you can see is that the capillaries are just large enough for the red blood cells to actually squeeze through. And um, it's designed that way so that when blood goes through the capillaries, it slows. Um, the capillaries, as I said, is, um, is the smallest diameter. And also, um, I got the wrong picture, but also if you look at the speed of the um, blood as it goes to the through the capillaries, it slows way down because what you want is you want the capillaries um, to uh, contain blood which travels very, very slowly to increase the chances of gas and substance exchange at the level of the capillaries. 
if you look at the um, structure of the capillaries, what you can see here is that it's really missing um, both the outer as well as the middle layer. So it really just have the basement um, membrane and the inner layer, the tunica in intima. So again, as I said, the tunica intima is simple, one layer squamous flat cells. And again, the one layer flat cells allow easy exchange of uh, gas and substances in and out of the capillaries. There are three different types of capillaries. The most common one is the continuous capillaries, and they are found in a lot of different places, except for when where fenestrated and sinusoidal capillaries are found, right? So you've got over here, what we have here is you have intercellular clefts where you have gaps between the endothelial cells for substances to go in and out of the, of the continuous capillaries. The second type of capillaries are fenestrated capillaries. And in the fenestrated capillaries, you still have those intercellular uh, clefts, but you also have these pores of fenestration. And what these pores do is it allows high volume fluid exchange, high volume fluid exchange. And so they are found in um, the glomerulus of the kidney in order for fluid and small dissolved substances to leave the capillaries in the glomerulus of the kidney very, very quickly. They're found in the small intestine, again, to allow absorption of nutrients into the blood vessels. Um, they're found in the choroid plexus where um, cerebrospinal fluid is, is, um, is uh, synthesized as well as endocrine gland, which produces hormones and that hor those hormones need to be released quickly. So that's the second type of capillaries. Third type of capillaries are the sinusoids. And what you can see in the sinusoids is you've got still the intercellular uh, cleft um, and you've got the fenestration. But what you also have is you have the, an incomplete basement membrane as well as these huge gaps. And these huge gaps allows big red blood cells to enter and exit the sinusoidal capillaries as well as proteins that are made to actually enter and exit the, the capillaries. And so when you look at where the sinusoids are found, they're found in the liver because the liver synthesizes large proteins as well as being the place for old red blood cells to die and be, um, be uh, destroyed. They're found in the bone marrow where red blood cells are produced and they're also found in the spleen where you have destruction of red blood cells taking place. So you can see that the location of the sinusoids and the fenestrated and the continuous capillaries is very tightly linked to the function of the tissues that they are found in. When we talk about capillaries, we have to talk about capillary beds. So this is a capillary bed. So blood goes into the capillary bed from the arterioles and um, as it leaves the arterioles to make its way into the capillary bed, there are met arterioles. So these are the met arterioles over here, right? It serves as a vascular shunt and you've got these pre-capillary sphincters. So if you look at the name, the pre-capillary sphincters are located just before the blood enters into the capillary bed Sphincters are circular muscles that can close and open depending on the need. And so what happens is the precapillary sphincters can open when there's a need for an increased blood flow into the capillary bed, or it can close when there's less need for blood to enter to go into the, that particular capillary, right? And when the blood, when the precapillary sphincters are shut, what happens is blood is shunted from the arterioles into the met arterioles, and then it's make its way uh, down the thoroughfare ch channel in through the venules and then back to the heart, right? So these are the functions 
of the capillary bed. Um, each tissue has a separate capillary bed. And so you can see over here, you've got these capillary beds in different organs and tissues of the body. And depending on the needs of the person, what happens is blood can be shunted to different areas. So for example, if we're digesting and uh, after a meal, what happens is blood is directed into the um, digestive organs and then it goes into the liver as well. Whereas when we're exercising, what happens is we want to reduce the blood flow in um, into the uh, um, digestive tract and funnel them or shunt them onto the skeletal muscles so that we can continue to exercise. In capillaries as well, because that is where um, gas and um, substance exchange happens, what happens is that there are um, a few different, there are four different pressures that you need to know about um, in the capillaries. So the first one is blood um, pressure. So we've got, if you look over here, you've got hydrostatic pressure. So hydro refers to water. So hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of the fluid against the wall, right? So if you have a bottle of water, um, water, um, and you poke a hole in the bottle of water, water always leaks, right? So where, wherever you have fluid, that fluid pushes against the wall that the fluid, uh, the wall of the container that the fluid is. And so that's hydrostatic pressure. So we've got blood hydrostatic pressure, which is a pressure of the blood against the capillary walls. And we've also got interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which is the pressure of the fluid outside of the blood vessels, outside of the cells. So remember interstitial fluid, if you have a whole bunch of cells over here and you have a blood vessel here, what happens is interstitial fluid is found outside the cells and outside of the blood vessels. And so again, anytime you have um, fluid over here, it exerts a pressure in the opposite direction to, um, it, it exerts a pressure against the um, um, blood vessel wall. So this is called the interstitial hydrostatic pressure. And then what you have is you have blood inside of the blood vessels, and that exerts a pressure on the inside of the blood vessel walls. And so this is called blood hydrostatic pressure. In the blood, you also have um, colloid osmotic pressure. And colloid osmotic pressure inside of the blood vessels is generated largely by plasma proteins such as albumin. And what happens is that albumin inside of the blood vessel wall helps to retain some blood, some fluid in the blood vessel wall. So it actually pulls fluid back into the blood vessel. And because we also have fluid outside of the blood vessel wall, the interstitial um, fluid that also has a colloid osmotic pressure. So the colloid osmotic interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure helps to retain fluid um, within the interstitial space. But the truth of the matter is that the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure is almost zero because there's really no proteins in the interstitial fluid, right? So you've got these four pressures going in different direction, which then um, help to direct um, flow of water and other substances across the capillary walls, okay? So when you've got bulk movement of fluid and other substances out of the capillaries, that's called filtration. And when you have bulk movement of fluid and other dissolved substances back into the capillaries, that's called reabsorption, right? And whether or not 
filtration or reabsorption or no net movement happens depends on the balance of these four pressures. So we're going to look at that as we go to this slide. So you see over here, net filtration pressure is a pressure at the end of the day. And what you can see here is net filtration pressure is different along the capillary bed. So towards the arterial end of the capillary bed, what happens is net filtration pressure is positive. And what happens is if we have a positive net filtration pressure, fluid and dissolved substances leave. As the blood goes in through the capillary bed at the mid capillary um, point, the, um, the net filtration pressure is zero. And so there's no net movement. So equal amount of things going in and out of the um, capillaries. And then towards the venule end of the capillary bed, what we can see here is that the net filtration pressure is negative. And so what happens is fluid and other dissolved substances go back in to the capillary bed. And this is good because you don't want filtration to be more than reabsorption. It's, if not, you have a buildup of fluid in the interstitial um, um, space and you end up with edema. So you want filtration and reabsorption to be roughly equal. Right, so that you don't have, um, you don't end up with dehydration of the tissues, and you don't end up with swelling of the tissues either. In terms of how substances move across the capillary beds, you can see over here, water moves via osmosis and is driven by bulk flow. So by net filtration pressure, small molecules diffuse directly through the endothelial uh, membrane. Um, ions and glucose and amino acids use transport proteins or uh, ion channels to actually move through or they can actually squeeze through the intercellular class. Larger molecules need um, the help of pores of fenestrated capillaries and then much larger molecules need the presence of sinusoids to actually um, enter and leave the capillary beds. Right. If the sinusoids aren't present, what happens is a red blood cell stays within the blood vessels. The large proteins stay within the blood vessels. And that's good. So that's capillaries will go into um, veins, veins and venules. So what you can see here is that as the um, blood goes through the capillaries, what happens is it then goes into the venules. And from the venules, the blood is collected into medium-sized veins. And from medium-sized veins, it's then collected into large veins. And then it goes back into the atria, right? So post-capillary venues, medium-sized, large veins, and then back into the atria of the heart. The venules are the prim primary site of emigration of dia or diapodesis of white blood cells. And this process of emigration and diapodesis is where white blood cells actually leave the blood vessels in order to go and um, perform its immune uh, function when there's an injury or um, an infestation of pathogens. Um, and as I said, veins and venules are blood vessels that return blood to the heart. So when you look at this picture over here, what you can see is the um, compared to the artery, veins are much larger diameter um, as well as floppier as well because the, the pressure in the veins is much lower. So it doesn't have to be um, a thicker lumen. There are some unique features of veins, especially in medium-sized veins, and, um, and these unique features help to return blood back to the heart. So one of the unique features are these valves, and these valves are very similar to the SL valves, the semilunar valves in the heart. And so if you look at over here, this, uh, this vein here with the valve over here, you have compartment one and compartment two. The heart is over here and we want to move blood back to the heart, right? So what happens is that when pressure in compartment one is higher than pressure, is higher than pressure in compartment two, what happens is the valve opens. 
and when the valve opens, it allows blood to move up back towards the heart. And then as blood goes from compartment one to compartment two, what happens is the pressure in compartment two becomes greater than the pressure in compartment one. And when that happens, the valve closes. And when the valve closes, blood can't go back down to compartment one. And so what happens is you have a series of valves in medium-sized veins, and these valves help to propel blood in stepwise progression back towards the heart. Okay, um, the diagram over here shows you that the pressure in um, in in uh, venules and um, as it goes makes its way back towards the uh, the heart gets lower and lower until it's almost practically zero when the blood goes into the right atrium. There are two venous pumps that help to move blood back into the heart. This is especially important for the peripheral blood vessels in our legs, as well as moving blood from our abdominal um, area back towards the thoracic area. So the two pumps are the respiratory pump and the skeletal muscle pump. The respiratory pump, as the name suggests, uses respiration in order to actually push blood up from below the diaphragm into the area above the diaphragm and then back into the heart, right? So it uses inspiration and expiration to sequentially move blood from the abdominal area into the thoracic cavity and then back into the heart. Whereas the skeletal muscle pump is found in peripheral blood vessels um, in our lower limbs. And what happens is that when our skeletal muscle in our lower limbs contract, it squeezes the um, uh, veins to actually try to push blood past the valves back towards the heart, right? So again, if you look at a peripheral vein, you have um, muscles on either side and these muscles when they contract help to squeeze blood up towards past successive veins back towards the heart. This is just a, a, a graph comparing a table comparing um, the layers of arteries versus veins so we talked about this this is just for your information. And then um, the next part is a di distribution of blood flow. So when we look at where blood is found in the circulation, what we can see here is in the yellow part, which is a systemic circulation, 84% of blood is found normally in the systemic circulation. And within the systemic circulation, you can see here that a large proportion of that 84% is housed in veins, right? Whereas you've got a smaller percent, much smaller percent in arteries and then a smaller percent still in capillaries. So that means that systemic veins are the reservoir or storage containers of blood. And they're also capacitance vessels because they can hold a high volume, 64% of all blood, um, in, in them. And so what happens is when we're exercising, these veins over here constrict in a process called venoconstriction. And some of this 64% of blood that's normally in, in systemic veins actually leave the systemic veins in order to actually circulate around the cardiovascular circulation. Right? So most of the blood is in the systemic circulation with most of that blood in the systemic veins. A small amount, just under 10%, is found in pulmonary circulation. And again, for that, you've got um, most of it in veins with um, almost equal amounts in arteries and capillaries. And then in the heart itself, in the four chambers, you have 7% um, contained within the heart with most of the blood um, in the ventricles or the ventricles can actually have more blood uh, capacity than the atria. 
when we're at rest. So this is this is just a distribution of blood within the cardiovascular system. When we're at rest, what we can see here is that the brain receives 15% of um, blood, um, roughly the skin, 5%, the heart, and then you've got just the different things, right? Um, and then as, we're, as we exercise, the distribution of blood then changes. When we look at the circulation through the heart, what happens is we've got the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. So there's, those are two distinct circulation circuit, but obviously they are linked. So I've tried to color code it here. So um, the pulmonary trunk coming out of the right ventricle um, and the pulmonary arteries carries deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle towards the lungs. Within the pulmonary capillaries in the lungs, oxygen enters the blood and carbon dioxide leaves the blood. And when the blood goes from the pulmonary capillaries into the pulmonary veins, the blood there is then oxygenated and it carries oxygenated blood from the pulmonary capillaries towards the left atrium of the heart. From the left atrium, it goes to the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, it goes into the aorta and the systemic arteries. And so the aorta and the systemic arteries carry oxygenated blood from the left ventricle towards the systemic tissues. And in the systemic tissues, we've got systemic capillaries where um, um, reactions happen and carbon dioxide is produced as a waste and so carbon dioxide leaves the, the, the uh, cells to enter into the blood within the systemic capillaries and the oxygen is needed as, as an energy source so oxygen leaves the systemic capillaries to enter into the tissues. And so um, then blood from the systemic capillaries goes into the systemic veins towards the vena cava. And because oxygen has left the blood in the systemic capillaries, then uh, the vena cava and the systemic uh, veins carries the oxygenated blood from the systemic capillaries back towards the heart, back towards the right atrium. Right, And then from the right atrium, it goes into the right ventricle, and then it goes around and around and around. This um, diagram shows the same thing, but just in a more of a mind map um, um, kind of uh, diagram. And so when you look at, at this, um, and you have those two um, sentences down below, what we can see is the systemic arteries carry up, oops, Systemic arteries carry oxygenated blood to tissues, where systemic veins carry deoxygenated blood um, back to the heart. Pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs, while pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood back to the heart. When we get to this um, slide, this is a slide that depicts the systemic blood pr pressure, so the pressure within the systemic circulation of the body. And what you can see here is when the ventricles contract and blood leaves the, um, the heart, you end up with this high pressure called systolic pressure, right? So systolic pressure is this, whereas when the ventricles relax, and no blood leaves the heart, we end up with diastolic pressure. And then the mean arterial pressure is an average of the pressure in systemic arteries, right? So again, I've got this diagram over here. This basically shows the same thing. But again, the reason why I like the diagram on the right is it shows the pressure 
of the uh, blood vessels as um, blood actually leaves the systemic capillaries and goes back into the heart. In order to measure blood pressure, um, we've got old school ways as well as, as uh, current ways. So um, old school uh, equipment uses a, uh, um, a stethoscope as well as a sphygmomometer, which is a blood pressure cuff, right, that goes usually around your upper arm. Um, attached to a measuring the device and the and the cuff goes around your upper arm and you can um, um, insert air in it to actually increase the pressure inside the cuff so some like this and usually we're measuring at the level of the brachial artery just because it's easiest to access right so the cuff is is uh, placed around the arm uh, pressure is uh, the cuff is filled with pressure with air, so the pressure goes up. Um, and then what happens is um, when it's higher than systolic pressure, it actually occludes or blocks or uh, um, um, reduces, um, decreases flow in the brachial artery. And so at a pressure that's higher than systolic pressure, you've got no blood moving into the um, brachial artery so that there's no movement of blood. And then as the pressure in the cuff is released, what ha happens is pressure drops. And as pressure reaches um, the systolic artery, you can hear the first heart sound, right? So these sounds are called Korotkov sounds. And so you can see here that the, you can see here that the sounds um, actually start when the cuff is released and the pressure in the cuff reaches systolic blood pressure, which is the higher of the two numbers. And as the cuff is released, you can hear, continue to hear those uh, Korotkov sounds until it reaches a level um, that is the diastolic pressure. And then what happens is then the, uh, um, you can't hear any more sounds, right? So you hear systolic pressure when, when it's higher than the cuff pressure, and then the sounds end when the cuff pressure is lower than the diastolic pressure, right? So um, this is just the old school way of, of doing things. Um, usually now it's automated, and so you don't even have um, 